liturgical season of Advent. And as you know, Advent, December, you know, um, is a time that's often filled with many activities, with shopping, decorating, which always leads to more shopping, um, and planning parties, right? And it's a season, though, that really what we want to be focusing on is preparing our hearts for the coming of Jesus. But the problem is, when our hearts are filled with so many distractions and too many things, we may not actually have room for Christ. So that's what we want to reflect on tonight, is how we can not only declutter our homes, but also our souls, and learn to live with just a little bit less. But first, I'm going to start out with uh, telling you uh, guys about what uh, inspired me to write this book. Okay, so at, about a few years ago, actually six, um, <laughs> we were living, my husband Art, who's sitting over there, and I, we were living out in one of those um, typical suburban McMansions, far, far away from work. In fact, it was like an hour and a half commute each way. And uh, for both of us, but I only work part time, so he was carrying the brunt of it, you know, every single day, day in, you know, every every day, sometimes even six days a week, he would have to go in um, an hour and a half each way. Um, so we're living in this giant place, um, just the two of us, because our kids were we were now empty nesters, so our kids had all moved out. And Art looks at me one day and he goes, you know, Lorraine. We are actually only living in 10% of this house. And yet, we spend a lot of money and time repairing the roof, fixing the leaks, painting, um, you know, cleaning, and all this stuff. And in fact, he says, it's really only, it's, it's actually a very well-decorated, 4,000 square foot storage unit. A storage unit for our kids' stuff. The stuff they did not want. <laughs> right? Okay, so we didn't have just a junk drawer. Some of you, probably everybody has a junk drawer, right? We had a junk room. It was 12 foot by 12 foot. Um, it was, we called it the office, right? And But it was filled with everything and also we had a garage that was filled with everything besides cars no cars in the garage um it was a two-car garage you know mind you we had plenty of room um but yet um we had you know i i had wanted to be a suburban um you know farmer uh, but so I was always trying to grow things you know so I was like so we had all the things you know all the garden tools and all the pesticides and all the the sacks of whatever you need and the lawnmowers and everything and we had the golf clubs and the baseball bats and the tents and the camping equipment and the skateboards and the bikes and oh all of my parents stuff after they had passed away so I had World War II steamer trunks. Um, I had their furniture that I hadn't, because when somebody passes away, you can't, it's very hard to get rid of their stuff um, because you, you, it reminds you of them. So I had all their stuff. I had furniture, I had paintings, I had many books, and I had knickknacks. Okay, this is all in the garage. There's also the 4,000 square foot house, right? Okay, <laughs> so, Anyway, so Art's idea was, and it was it was brilliant, um, it's like, what if we sell this house? What if we get rid of all this stuff, downsize, and live close to where we work, like 15 minutes away from where we work? Wow, what a concept. So and this was pretty amazing, so we were like, yeah, let's do it. And we started on this process of getting rid, it was at least, 20 or more trips to the dump, at least. And plus there were, we had to sell or donate all our stuff, right? Um, so this process, it was really, really, it was really, really hard. That's what I discovered. 
It was so hard that I came down with a case of the shingles. <laughs> anyway, but it was so after which I said, okay, there is a vaccine for that, you know? <laughs> but anyway, um, but the thing is, it, I discovered how hard it is. And it, what I realized when I was thinking about it is there, have to, there must be some virtues involved in this process of downsizing and of decluttering and organizing. And I wanted to know what those virtues were. And then I started thinking, well, of course, what about St. Therese, the little flower? All things small for her, right? The little way. And she it exemplified, she, she practiced heroic virtue, of course, but she practiced charity, she practiced trust, poverty of spirit, simplicity, gratitude, and all these virtues are involved in trying to, whatever you're trying to do, whether it's a big project of downsizing or it's just decluttering one room. So I turned to her and I um, started, that was the part of the process of writing this book was each chapter in the book it takes a different virtue that St. Therese exemplifies and we look at her life as well as you know, applying it to our own lives. Um, so one of the things, when she summarized her little, her little way of living with less, she said, quote, it is the way of spiritual childhood, the way of trust and absolute surrender. And when you're trying to get, get rid of things, <laughs> when you're trying to let go, you, what you really do need is trust and surrender. So I'm going to talk tonight just briefly about a few of, of the spiritual lessons that I learned from St. Therese, but you can always, you know, I have the books over there, you can always, um, you know, read, read the book and, and um, see all the rest of it. Each chapter has a spiritual um, lesson from St. Therese as well as a practical tip from an, an, a professional organizer who um, she has the very, very practical things that you can do in order to declutter and organize your house. Okay, um, but also since this is date night, um, I was thinking, how are we going to do this for as a date night? Right? <laughs> Without starting fights. <laughs> so I came up with um, three uh, little exercises that we're going to try here um, with your spouse. Everybody, I assume, has their spouse with them. Um, and so we'll see how that is. It's going to be a little experiment in uh, make sure, see how we, well we can work on this topic together with, without, uh, and, and at the same time grow closer to our spouse. Okay. <laughs> so in that case, you know, before we do these exercises, you might, you know, help yourself to more wine or beer. <laughs> okay. So, so we're going to start with the problem of clutter. Okay, did you know that when the eye sees clutter, the brain shifts into problem-solving mode? Neuroscience has discovered that this shift is accompanied by an increase in adrenaline, creating a sense of urgency and sometimes even anxiety. Plus, the average home has 300,000 items in it. And that's a lot of potential anxiety. <laughs> so clearing out the clutter of your desk or your bedroom or your home will help you return to a more peaceful state. Oh no, <laughs> somebody saying no. <laughs> but the less stuff we have, the less cluttered our environment, it really, the less stress we will have, okay? But to effectively declutter, we're going to have to also detach from our possessions, which is a difficult task. And sometimes doesn't it seem that our possessions almost seem to cast a spell on us? If we aren't attentive, our possessions might even begin to possess us, like the power of the ring in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings that leads Gollum to become a slimy, creeping hoarder who lives in the dark guarding his precious. So why do things have this ability to cast a spell over us? 
Why do we not recognize that too many things are like too much food? We don't need them, and it can make us sick with the sadness of too much. In fact, three of the Gospels record the incident of the rich young man who went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, I'm not saying we all have to give everything away and walk around barefoot and live in a tent, you know. <laughs> but it is true that when our hearts are filled with earthly loves and creature comforts and material possessions, we just have less room for God. So why do things seem to have the power over us? Well, it's really because we give it to them. So it's most likely original sin. But think about the story of the Israelites in the desert, okay? Um, think about the story where God has been leading the Israelites out of slavery. They were slaves in Egypt, okay? And he, he's leading them personally through the desert. He has a pillar of cloud, you know, by day and the pillar of fire by night. And he feeds them with manna in the desert so they don't... You know, they're not hungry, they have the, then they even have quail, you know, so they have meat. Okay, so they're taken care of. They're going through the desert, and then one day, Moses says, okay, I'm just going to go up the mountain, and I'm going to go talk to God, okay? And he has, he's not gone five minutes, and the Israelites are like, where's Moses? And then they go, is God really with us? Where's God? What are we going to do? I know. Let's make a molten calf. And we go, those crazy Israelites, right? A molten calf, come on. Why would you do that? Like, We just think that's a silly story out of the Bible. But it's not true. It actually is. We are like that ourselves. Because what happens? Don't we do the same thing when we think God is not there for us, or when we're feeling insecure, or we're feeling alone, or sad, you know, uh, miserable? What do we do? I don't know about you, I like to go shopping, you know, <laughs> but it's, it, so what happens is we turn to an idol, something else, other than God, that is meant that we are kind of temporarily using it to fill our fill our need that we experience. So that's what it is. We kind of make an idol out of something else. It's like it might be secure. It doesn't have to be things. Many people, for many people, it is things, material things. But it could be just a sense of security, or it could be um, power. Some people power, and some people prestige. Uh, there many things could be other than God. And really what we want is to have God be, have that primary place in our hearts. So, sometimes do we depend too much on how we appear to other people? Or how perfect our home is? Or maybe it's our kids' success in school. Or maybe it's having enough money in the retirement account. Do we think we'd be happier if we lived somewhere else? Or maybe if our spouse had a better job? Or maybe if our spouse was more loving. Or maybe, do we fully realize actually our true happiness lies in Christ? So whenever we place any of these things above our love for Christ, then we're doing the very thing that the Israelites were doing with their molten calf. And we become actually sad because of it, like the young man in the gospel. And St. Therese assures us in her writings, she says, Happiness has nothing to do with the material things that surround us. It dwells in the very depths of our souls. So the first lesson that I want to take from St. Therese is that lesson of trust. To trust more in God, in his divine providence, in that little way of trust and surrender. But also, especially for us as married couples, since we're here tonight as, at date night, um, we should trust in the beauty of the sacrament of marriage. A sacramental marriage is a covenant. It's not just a contract. 
A covenant is what God established with Abraham. It's what enabled Abraham to trust God, even though he, God asked him to sacrifice his son. He said, I trust you, even, you know, you said, God said, you're going to make my descendants as, as many as the stars in the sky. He said, well, uh, you know, even though you're asking me to do this thing, I will trust you because I believe in you and we have a covenant. And then in the end, God didn't make him sacrifice his son. So here is our first date night exercise. Yeah. <clears throat> Everybody stand up and fall into the arms. You no. Um, <laughs> I think it's called the trust fall or something, right? No, we're not going to do that. Um, however, what I want, I'm going to ask you guys to do this. Okay, I'll explain it. You're each going to take a turn. So start with, we'll start with the wives to the husbands, and then we'll switch after a couple of minutes. We'll switch from the to the, the husbands to the wives. But what we're going to do is we're going to say, I trust you, and I trust you with and you're going to name something. And it could be something big, or it could be something little. It's okay. Um, it could be something spiritual, or it could be something material. Um, anything you want. And, for example, you could say something big might be, I trust you with this new job you want to apply for because I know you love me, and you're going to do what's best for our family. And because we have a covenant. <laughs> um, or it could be something small. Here's a really good one. I trust you to load the dishwasher, and I will not rearrange the dishes after you do it. Because <laughs> I trust that you can actually load the dishwasher by yourself. <laughs> uh, or here's, here's one for the guys, okay? I trust that when you tell me how you're feeling, you're not exaggerating. I won't roll my eyes, and I won't say you're overreacting. <laughs> I will trust that you know your feelings. Okay, so those are some examples, and I want you to think. Each you would take you could take a minute to think, or if you want, and then another minute to share. So we're going to start with the ladies go first. And you turn to your spouse. Everybody have a spouse? <laughs> okay, on your market set, go. Yeah. Okay, the second lesson that I would like to um, propose from St. Therese is poverty of spirit. Now, though St. Therese entered the Carmelite monastery at 15, she grew up in a beautiful house with many beautiful things, and she understood very well at a very young age the allure of material possessions and an elegant lifestyle. In one, at one point she wrote, quote, I love to return in spirit to the enchanting places where they lived, wondering where these people are. What became of their houses and gardens where I saw them enjoy life's luxuries? And I see that all is vanity and vexation of spirit under the sun. That the only good is to love God with all one's heart and to be poor in spirit here on earth. Now, so what did she mean by what is poverty of spirit? And spiritual writers say that poverty of spirit is a particularly challenging spiritual reality. It's a virtue that's even more difficult to come by, and sometimes is painfully acquired through the most difficult circumstances of our lives. Sometimes a serious illness, the death of a loved one, or even a tragedy, to discover the one good thing, as St. Therese said. So my youngest daughter and her family are minimalists. Um, when, when I was writing the book, so I asked her for some thoughts on how, because she's, you know, they have little kids, two young children so far, and um, I asked her for her thoughts on how 
how can you limit your possessions, especially when you have little kids in the house? Um, and you know how ba people who have babies, they have, you know, piles of things. Um, you know, it seems like for every baby you have, you need another room of the house or something because they, there's so much baby equipment. But anyway, so I asked her for some, like, tips on this. And she gave me some tips, which I can share with you later, because I have I'm saving my practical things for questions. So um, she they have quite a few tips, including well, here's just one. Um, they don't want their kids to have too many toys, because when they have so many things, then they actually each thing is actually devalued. So they want and they want them to just like really appreciate the few things they have, and also to appreciate going outside to play. But anyway, um, so. So very, uh, you know, curiously, before the book went to print, so a, they, a, a fire broke out in their house, okay, and entirely burned down the house. They, uh, smoke detectors didn't go off, no fire alarms. It was, actually it was the grace of God, you know, that, that they were protected. Um, but they escaped with only seconds to spare in their bare feet and PJs. So I described what's hap what happened in the book, but um, the main takeaway was that we now understood what truly matters. It was their precious lives and not their possessions. And it, it was like, it was such a lesson for all of us. Um, and when things like that happen, you do, you're jolted into seeing what truly matters in your life. And you realize that things are not people. Okay, but so often we get caught up in the, we just tend to kind of relapse like the Israelites in the desert who kept wanting to go back to the flesh pots of Egypt. We also want to hold on to what is familiar to us and what's in our comfort zone. Yet we too are on a pilgrimage just like the Israelites. We're on a pilgrimage to our true home, which is heaven. And God wants us to appreciate and to, to, to truly uh, enjoy the beautiful things of this world, but we have to keep everything in perspective. And that's part of what she meant by having poverty of spirit and really appreciating the one good thing. That means keep everything in the proper order. So first is God and then our family, but then, you know, the other things. And try to remain fixed on the the love of God, and try to keep the love of other things in their proper place. So, you know, it, it's, it's really tough, because we do keep doing the same thing that the Israelites did, which is we fall back into, um, and even after, so I'll tell you, go back to the story of our downsizing, right? I'm, I'm really kind of at this point now, I, it's been several months, and I, um, I'm patting myself on the back. You know, I'm pretty good at this downsizing stuff, and I'm pretty good at getting rid of cut. No, it was really tough at first, but now I'm really in the swing of things. I'm really, we're giving stuff away now, and we're just, you know, woo, you know, we, we're just sending stuff off to the, to the um, dump, you know, just willy-nilly. And... Um, but then, so then we're, we're, you know, we're actually moving. It's moving day, and we're coming into our new tiny home. So from 4,000 square feet down to 1,500. And I'm like, yeah, this is great, telling the movers where to put stuff. And they bring in my prized possession. Okay, uh-oh, right, you know? What is my prized possession? I, I thought I was so good at decluttering and downsizing and detaching. However, there was this beautiful um, cherry Amish farmhouse table, dining room table and set, you know, the chairs and the, everything that goes with it. Um, and the movers say, excuse me, ma'am, uh, this table does not fit in your dining room. <laughs> and I'm like, no, let's, let's decide, did you try it this, this way? And that, did you try it? How about if we push it up against the wind? Nope. It still doesn't fit. And I'm thinking, how did these people even eat back in 1940? You know, <laughs> but they didn't have 
giant suburban houses with big furniture, you know, they had they had small, tiny things, I guess. Um, and they even had more kids, you know, than we did, and they somehow managed to live in these places. And so at this point, all these negative thoughts are going through my mind, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, okay, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm taking apart the table, and I put it under our bed. <laughs> And, and it's, it's under the bed, kind of messing with the feng shui, you know, but um, every morning I would kind of like stub my toe on the part that stuck out from under the bed. Uh, so, but, you know, that was my very, very special. I mean, do you know how many Christmas dinners we had at that table? And, you know, Thanksgiving dinners and Easter. And what was I going to do? How would I ever have another family gathering without this table? Um, so I'm telling a friend about this, the saga of the table, and that it was under our bed. And he's like, are, are you crazy? <laughs> Why don't you give your table to somebody who needs it? Um, and in fact, there's a... There's a, a saying for one of the Desert Fathers. If you ev don't ever acquire anything for yourself that you would hesitate to give to somebody who really needed it. So then I'm like, you're right. Well, first of all, I was mad at him. but um, And I said, well, easy for you to say because it's not your table. You know, <laughs> it's my table. <laughs> anyway, but then I said, you know what? You're right. You're right. And um, so we ended up giving it to our son and daughter-in-law and their four kids so you know and they're like we're like do you need a big big table and they're like yes we do <laughs> and so we're like great so we do get we get to see this table every time we go back over to their house um anyway but that was a lesson for me you know and it's a lesson how we we can always it, it it's so difficult to detach from things just when you think you detach they're they, we do tend to really enjoy these possessions that we have. And ultimately, though, what we really need to detach from is anything that holds us back from loving God and our spouse with our whole hearts, minds, soul, and strength, right? Um, so this is what we're going to do for our second date night exercise. Yay. So, yay! <laughs> so we're going to start with the, the wife. And the, so wife to husband, husband to wife will do the same thing a couple of minutes each. And um, if you don't have a, a partner to do it with, you can write it down and take it to adoration or talk to Father Bob about it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, what, whatever you want to do. Um, so here's the exercise. Okay. You can tell your spouse one, what is one thing you would really like to detach from. And you could even let him or her know like whether whether or not he he could he or she could help you with that. Um, so here's an example. I'll just throw out a couple of examples. So you know like I just I love hunting through thrift stores and garage sales, but I need to stop collecting things. You know, I really need to stop. So I need help with that. Maybe I don't know how somebody might he might have a good idea with that. I don't know. Um, or Maybe I spend way too much time on social media. That's something else um, that I can detach from. And it really tends to, uh, social media, and this is actually really, really true. You know, Instagram's like, how many times have I like been sucked into buying something off of Instagram? Because it just knows, they know how to appeal to you and they just, they, they know me. The algorithm knows all, you know? <laughs> so, um, or here's something for guys. Um, okay, you know, I love Sunday afternoon football, or the Commanders, I love the Commanders, but, okay, it's too much to ask somebody to give that up, but, okay, maybe I want to detach just a little from my sports, you know, attachment, and um, perhaps when I'm in the car with my wife, I won't turn on sports talk radio, you know, or that, something like that, a small thing. It doesn't have to be huge. Could be just a small thing, and you could say these are the things, or you pick whatever you want, and then you share that with your your partner. So we're going to start with detaching. So this is detaching. It could be a thing, it could be a material possession, or it could be something not a material possession, and just say this is something I'd like to detach from. 
And then, so you, wives, go first and share that with your husband, and I'm going to time you. There's a third lesson from St. Therese, and that is a positive one. So prior we were talking about uh, maybe detaching and being poor in spirit, um, but the third lesson is, is very positive, and that is gratitude. And psychologists have discovered that what saints and spiritual writers have always known, that being thankful, expressing our gratitude, performing acts of kindness, actually increase our sense of well-being and happiness. Grateful people are happy people. And a huge temptation, I think, for women especially, is to compare ourselves with our friends. Um, you know, sometimes to suffer anxiety about the way we look or about the way our homes look, the way our children behave, or and to just kind of wish that our lives were other than they are. And our culture actually makes this temptation even greater because of social media. It really fuels that. Um, because we're constantly comparing ourselves with other people that we actually never would have even known about before in the past. Like, we would never have seen other people's lives to the incredible detail that we see them now. And uh, through social media, it's just like, it, it was un, unimaginable, I guess, you know, many years ago. And now we just, I know all these people, it's like, why do I even care about these other people that I don't even know? And yet, then they're making me feel like I'm less you know, somehow not, a, you know, a good enough person, right? And it's just, it's just craziness, really. But <clears throat> anyway, I, I was thinking men also probably have that temptation in a way to comparison, but I would think it's more likely to surround maybe issues of work, um, providing for the family, maybe comparing with others in terms of how our yard looks in comparison with our neighbors. You know, I always seeing the men, the men are always somehow... Like, as soon as the, uh, the neighbor across the way is, like, doing the leaves, you know, it's like, oh, better do my leaves, okay, or we're going to look bad. Anyway, it's interesting. So we, men also have, you know, those kinds of comparison things that happen. Um, a priest once said, compare and despair. So, <laughs> wise priest. <laughs> Anyways, another interesting comparison of men and women is there was a Japanese study, <clears throat> excuse me, comparing men and women's solutions when confronted by clutter in the home. And so the women decided to purchase organizing solutions, whereas the men just said, they, we just want to buy a bigger home. <laughs> but the answer is not more consumerism, really. The answer really is gratitude. So gratitude is the antidote to overconsumption anxiety, and envy about material things. St. Therese teaches us that gratitude is at the heart of the little way. She explains that gratitude draws down God's grace on us. Here is a quote from St. Therese. It is the spirit of gratitude which draws down upon us the overflow of God's grace. For no sooner have we thanked him for one blessing than he hastens to send us Ten additional favors in return. Then when we show our gratitude for these new gifts, he multiplies his benedictions to such a degree that there seems to be a constant stream of divine grace. And she even talked about the parable that was that we had tonight in, in the in at Mass, um, in today's gospel. And he he who has more will be given, you know. That seems like an odd thing to say, but she explained it in terms of gratitude and grace. So he who is grateful will receive more grace. And she mentions gratitude over and over in the story of the soul. She explains that Jesus does not demand great actions or mighty deeds from us, but simply surrender and gratitude. She recognized that everything is a gift from God. Everything is grace. And really, when you practice like really practical ways of, of being grateful, like let's say you thank somebody, you know, you thank your spouse for taking out the trash. Just a simple thing like that. 
Um, well, it, 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 it has a wonderful effect in several ways because one is it makes the other person will then want to do again <laughs> that nice thing that you thank them for. Um, and it then also makes you feel better because you feel happier because that's what you know the psychologist has found, that when you are expressing gratitude, you feel happy. So, so these are wonderful uh, ways in which gratitude can just help on the very simple level of, of your home life. Um, so what I want to do, so here's the third and final exercise that you guys get to practice. And this is going to be um, expressing your sincere gratitude to your spouse um, for something. And it, can't, it doesn't have to be the most amazing thing that you can possibly ever think of. It could be just what, what comes to mind tonight, given the pressure of this, you know, <laughs> this situation. Um, but so you can always, if you come up with something better, later on tonight or tomorrow, you can share that as well with your spouse. And the, here's the rule though, the rules are, you it has to be unqualified, there's no, you can't say something like, well, the very few times that you helped me out around the house, I really appreciate that, okay? I mean, I know it's like a couple times maybe. Okay, no, that doesn't count. That's a no-no. <laughs> it has to be 100%, 150% wonderful. You, you, you're amazing. You're awesome. Okay. So now we're gonna do that, and it can be a, it can be um, on whatever you want. It can be a, at a practical level or a spiritual level or whatever. Um, so, okay, go ahead and start. Start with the women, and then we'll switch to the men. Go. Okay, everybody, time's up. And remember, you can always share that wonderful thing that you're so grateful for about your spouse. Share with them later tonight if you come up with another wonderful thing about your spouse, which I'm sure you will. Um, you know, share that with them. And um, so just to sum up, I want to be clear that I'm not, I don't think, what we want our homes to be is, really places um, where everyone is welcome, where our loved one, you know, where we really make our loved ones feel seen, feel heard, feel loved and nurtured. And it's really about creating spaces of light, refreshment and peace. And that's what we want in our homes. And usually it helps to declutter but it's, it's a long road, and if you need to start with just one tiny thing, start with a, one drawer, you know? That's always good, you start small. Just start with one drawer, one room, anything you can. Um, and that's what really what we wanna do, but really, ultimately, it's all about, it's about the love that we share with our family and with our friends and about that room that we can make in our hearts for God. And so really that's our main focus. It's not about the things, and um, hopefully it is about kind of letting go of some of the things that, that are encumbering us. So and to summarize from St. Therese, you know, uh, trust, trust in God, trust in our spouse, and also um, that gratitude that we have for our spouse and gratitude to God for all the many blessings that he's given us and then also to really keep in mind that one the one truly good thing which is God got our our love for God and our knowledge that God loves us as well so that's the end of my talk and I do have some practical tips if you have any questions along that line but I did want to keep the uh, discussion tonight to be more on the date night kind of um, kind of thing and weaving in the, the decluttering as we as we went so I'm happy to take any questions even practical questions if you have them yes thank you thank you 
Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, and in the book, too, I do have like that professional organizer who's super good at it. Um, so I just kind of stumbled along learning as, as I went. But um, yeah, so um, I kind of like the Marie Kondo thing because um, she, part of what she did was she said, you know, keep the things that spark joy. And so you either keep something because it's necessary, you know, like you have to have, you know, a sharp knife for cutting your vegetables or whatever, but you don't need 20 knives, you know, so, or, or maybe you have that knife that sparks joy, you know, because it's like, wow, it's a Japanese Sentoku knife or something, right? You know, so, so, you know, you don't want to open your shelf, your kitchen cupboard and have all the mugs fall out because you have so many. So you can throw away the chipped ones and the old ones and the ones that don't mean anything and just keep a few very special ones. And so for me, decluttering was about keeping the things that were really meaningful to me or absolutely necessary. <laughs> yeah, so I, I hope that answers it. The question I didn't, didn't repeat, I should have repeated any tips on, on decluttering, right? And also start small. Start with one room or one space. Like, don't try, don't say, this weekend I'm going to declutter the whole house. You know, that's going to be, um, you know, <laughs> probably doomed to failure. <laughs> so just take one, one small space or one room to start out with. How do I, okay, how do we avoid the justification that I need this because of some future possibility? Yes. Right. Yeah, and it's very interesting. I had to kind of talk myself through it because, you know, like the table that it, it, it represented future gatherings. And also it represented like I wanted all of my kids and their spouses to come to my house, which, if you think about it, is actually unrealistic because so many, and I've talked to so many people and they share the same thing. It's Nobody can ever get anybody all together again. Like, oh, well, sometimes you can, but it's not going to happen every holiday, you know, event. And because most likely they have to trade off, they have to go to their, you know, their the other in-laws, you know, or they live far away, they moved away, they can't get back. Um, everybody's got these complicated schedules, so it's not anymore about. It's almost like it's a fantasy in our minds that we have this imagined, perfect, beautiful event that rarely actually happens. And so, I mean, what we did is we just like, we kind of rotate, we, we took it, it's almost like the Posada thing, you know, where they go to different houses, you know? So now we were like, okay, it's, you know what? I'm gonna, what I'm giving up is I'm not in charge of the event. And I'm gonna say, you know what? I'll, I'll bring my stuff, my, I'll, in fact, this, this week, this Thanksgiving, I'm bringing the turkey over to my daughter-in-law's house, you know, and we're gathering at the daughter-in-law's house. And prior to that, my daughter wanted to have it at her house, but this year she just had a baby, so she doesn't want it at her house. And she also said she doesn't want to come to my house. She just flat out said no. And she's like, no, I'm not going any further than next door, which is where my daughter-in-law lives. <laughs> but anyway, but my point being, it's not my imagined scenario of everybody always coming, you know, to my house is actually not necessarily happening. So, yeah, anyway. And then I know people who, you know, they said, I'm going to buy, they buy the house in Florida, right? Everybody's going to come visit me because it's Florida and it's beautiful weather. And guess what? Nobody goes. What? I don't understand. Like, it's Florida, it's beautiful weather, and their kids don't come. So, you know, the best laid plans. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. That's why I wrote that book. But anyway. <laughs> well, I can't, I'm actually happy to sell you a copy of my book. Um, <laughs> but that's a really big question, but that is kind of what I was trying to address. But Definitely for us, well, just on the, at the very basic level, like think about having a commute that's 15 minutes, which is what happened when we immediately, um, you know, moved, versus 
I mean, we gained three hours in every day. So we had a lot more time. We were, um, actually we, and that's the thing about making time, you know, like having more time for God. We were able to sit and have a cup of coffee and do a morning meditation. Where before, Art would have to, every single day of the week, he would have to jump in the car at the crack of dawn and, you know, get on the road. And so now, you know, we actually have more time in the day. Like, that's a wonderful thing. And so we're less stressed right there. And then the second way we're less stressed is a small house. It's like, I cannot tell you how much easier it is to clean. <laughs> so, I mean, those are just two simple things. But really, we did it. I would say the whole process was a spiritual journey, and that's what I try to, to, to describe in the book. But yes, that is in all the lessons, just the three that I shared with you today are three of the lessons that I learned, but there's many more lessons to be learned from the whole process. Yeah, and really our lives are a process of detaching because what happens is we have to detach from everything in a, because we're gonna leave here and we can't take anything with us other than our love for God and our, our family, I guess, you know, what's in our hearts. Um, but we can't even, I was just reading uh, recently, a saint, I think, wrote in, uh, I can't remember which saint it was, we, can, we, we can't even take our accomplishments. And I thought that was really interesting because a lot of us think a lot about our accomplishments, but really we're just, we're just going that, we have to detach from everything in order to, and, and I think if we don't, God will, it, it will happen. And it might be rougher than we might like if, than if we tried to do it. You know, the thief in the night, he, it, I think it was today during the reading when it, it's like the children of light are supposed to be not caught off guard. And I think part of the way we're not caught off guard is because we've, try, we've been intentionally trying to detach uh, from the things of the world. Whereas the thief in the night comes and really terrifies those who have not prepared at all, like in any way, in terms of detaching from the world. So I think that is why it's an important thing for all of us to work on. Yeah, so that's, that's the end of my talk, and uh, if you have any other questions, I guess I'll, I'll go over there where I have the books, <laughs> and I'll just uh, answer any other questions if you have any at that time. Thank you.